Xavier used the word ignorant. Uh, it's a good way to start. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.11 said, the, the Apostle Paul said, lest Satan get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Unfortunately, the church has become ignorant of his devices. And we really don't uh, hear too much about Satan and his devices. When I came into the faith years ago, back in 1984, the word counterfeit was all over the place. It was counterfeit for everything that was real. Uh, novels like uh, This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti were, were crackling with uh, spiritual energy in terms of churches dealing with the battle. The, the song that we did uh, before Ray spoke about the reality of the battle. Then we have books today like The Shack. And unfortunately, if you look through that book, you'll never find the word Christ and you'll never find the word Satan. And you'll find on page 112 that he says, that Jesus says that God, who is the ground of all being, dwells in and around and through all things. That's the bottom line of the New Age. It's the bottom line of this merging, emerging church. I just want to start off by saying it's really important. Xavier said, you know, I don't want to get into semantics, he said earlier about the emerging church. I hardly recommend that you don't get into like, oh, is it emergent or emerging? It's either biblical or it's unbiblical. I mean, it's as simple as that. And like a snake sheds its skin, you know, these movements, the New Age no longer calls itself the New Age because it was exposed back in the 80s and the early 90s. But uh, now it calls itself, the New Age calls itself the new spirituality, the new spirituality. Funny thing, a lot of these emerging, emergent, merging church leaders are now referring to what they do as the new spirituality. One of the most significant ways that Satan is pulling off, and he is pulling off this deception mightily as we speak, is by using overlapping language. The church has, you know, a term, like Rick Warren talks about a, a new reformation, and meanwhile, the New Age is talking about a new reformation. If you're not defining your terms from the church's standpoint, you won't know what the New Age is doing. So what you end up with is a new re-formation, a reformation of the church and what it believes. And what you'll find in the emerging church, and we'll talk more about this this afternoon, is that the Bible is being pushed aside and spiritual experience is being hailed as the way to know God. Contemplative prayer, we'll, we'll talk about that. But spiritual experience, like you don't really know God unless you've experienced God. You can't just read dry words in a book. I've actually got an amazing quote from Shane Claiborne, one of the emerging church leaders. And he basically says in his book, Irresistible Revolution, he says, if you haven't read the Bible, that's probably good because some of us have read it so many times it gets stale. Those are his words. I really believe that these guys are ashamed of the gospel. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think they're ashamed of the whole gospel. If you're looking at Acts 20, 27, when the Apostle Paul said, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And that means that you need to tell your friends when they become a Christian that persecution is part of the game. I mean, that's, that's a given. You are going to be persecuted. All those, you know, who are godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There is a battle going on. You will be tested. You will be tempted. In the parable of the sower and the seed, in Matthew and Mark, it says that those who love the Lord, their, their roots were not very deep. So when affliction and persecution and tribulation came, they fell away. In Luke, in that same parable, it says when temptation came, Christians are being tempted to experience this new spirituality, to have a more, quote unquote, relevant faith. Like there's something wrong with just holding on for your life to the Bible and to what it says. My story is, well, the Apostle Paul again said in 2 Corinthians 11:3. He was worried, and he told the Corinthian church, he said, you know, just as Eve was seduced by the serpent, he says, I'm concerned about you. And then he talked about the simplicity that's in Christ. The simplicity. 
Well, there's a simplicity in a deception. And I want to just give you an overview of what that deception is so that you'll recognize it. Ray's talked about it already. I'm sure that you're aware of many aspects of it. But I'm going to do that in the context of my own life because I was, I was a social worker for 30 years. I mean, I, 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 I haven't been like, you know, going out and warning everybody, you know, for, for, I mean, I've done that, but not in a formal sense. I mean, I was a social worker. I worked at the San Francisco Greyhound bus station at night as a traveler's aid social worker with people who were stranded and homeless. Uh, I worked with hospice as a hospice social worker. I, I, I ran homeless programs. I never thought that I would get deceived to the extent that I did. I'll give you a quick example. When I was with Traveler's Aid, a young man came in. He'd been up in Northern California with the Moonies. Some of you, you know, probably are aware of the Moonies. It's, it was a, a, a deviant cult-like group that was very popular. It had people at the airport handing out flowers and getting money. Sun Young Moon, who actually owns the Washington Times in the middle of all of our political scene down there, who claims, Moon claims to be the Messiah. This man went up to the uh, commune that the Moonies had up in, in Northern California, and he found out very quickly that he felt he was being indoctrinated and brainwashed, and he fled for his life. He landed in San Francisco. Somebody told him about Traveler's Aid. He came to me. He told me his whole story. This was probably back like around 1978, dating myself. So he told me his story, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, well, after he leaves, you know, we, we got him a room for the night, and he was coming back down to L.A. is where he, his brother was. He didn't want to bother his family because he was so embarrassed about what he'd got involved in. But that was what we were there for, and it was legitimate, and, you know, he was really trying to do right. So we helped him. And as he, as he left, and as I sat there kind of writing the case notes and reflecting, I thought to myself, how can anybody get involved with a charismatic group leader like Moon and a cult-like group like that? Little did I know that three years later, four blocks away in the basement of the Congregational Church, I would be jumping up and down and doing a Rajneesh meditation dedicated to the guru, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, and I would be with a hundred other sannyasins, very enmeshed in that movement. How did that happen? How does somebody go, and this is happening, by the way, in the church today, where somebody's having a spiritual experience and they're being converted right into this experiential Christianity that's now calling itself the emerging church, or if you've seen the cover of Christianity Today this month, they've got a picture of Jesus in sunglasses knocking on the door, you know, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and it's about Christian hipsters. This is probably the new phrase for the emerging church. That's why you, you just can't keep track of all this and you don't need to. But what Jesus is probably doing there, knocking on the door, behold, I stand at the door and knock, is he's telling the person on the other side, hey, you don't have to open the door, just go to your inner Jesus and, and talk to me there. I mean, that's where, it's, that's where it's heading. I want to bring this in, give an overview, and then how I got involved in it. The new age, the new spirituality, where I deeply believe that the, the emerging church is heading, is the idea that all of humanity is God. All of humanity is the body of Christ. We're all connected because we're all divine. Because we're all divine, we're all God. We just have to, and these are phrases that are being overlapped, we have to awaken, the great awakening in the new age is not the same as in the church. You have to awaken to your inner divine self, the God that's within you, the Christ that's within you. You move from your ego to your essence. Think about that. You move from your ego, and you forsake that, and you go to the God within. That's like the biggest ego trip in the world. You, you leave your ego and go to the God within. This is Satan. Satan does everything backwards. He loves to mock the church. In one of the teachings that I had when I was in the New Age, A Course in Miracles, which Oprah has pushed and we'll talk more about, the Jesus of the Course in Miracles, who is another Jesus, not the real Jesus, he says there are many paths to God and their names are legion. Do you kind of smell the, the scent of a serpent there? I mean, this, this, it's getting more and more blatant. 
how did I get involved? Uh, it wasn't because I was so spiritual. It was because I was enamored with a waitress in a downtown restaurant in Northern California where I lived. <laughs> this happens to a lot of guys. And so she came over to my house for dinner, invited her over for dinner, and in the course of the evening's conversation, she said, I have a friend who's coming in from out of town. I have a friend of a friend who's coming in from out of town who's a psychic from Canada. How would you like to get a psychic reading? Well, I'm from the East Coast and, you know, a little skeptical, a um, little conservative. That wasn't really my cup of tea, but hey, you know, I wanted to ingratiate myself with her, so a typical guy I said, well, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So the psychic came, and without belaboring it too much, I was amazed that she could tell me the things that she told me about myself. I didn't have any understanding of Acts 16:16, 16, 16, where Paul and Silas were hounded by this psychic, this soothsayer, this Philipp Philippian uh, psychic. And what did they find? What did he finally do? He finally addressed the spirit of divination and said, "Spirit of divination, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command that you leave." The spirit left, and what does the Bible account tell us? The soothsayer, the psychic, could no longer do her readings because it was a spirit that was doing the readings. It wasn't like she had some gift, or it wasn't like, you know, you know before somebody becomes a Christian, you, know, you become a Christian, and then God turns that into a, a, a Christian gift of word from the Lord. No, it's the spirit of divination. The whole Philippian jail scene happened, and the jailer and his whole household got saved because a psychic was put out of business in Philippi. But I didn't know that. So I'm, I'm really impressed. I mean, she's telling me things that are just beyond. I, nothing I told my friend the waitress or nothing I told her. And then, towards the end of the reading, there was a whirling sensation over my head. And it was very weird. I mean, I never had anything like that happen. It was just like, it just felt like whirling right over there, kind of like a lot of energy. And without my saying anything to the psychic, she said, are you aware that there's a ball of light over your head right now? And I said, I don't know what that is, but I said, I, I feel it. And I said, what's Ball of Light doing up there? And she said, she said, well, you have a lot of help on the other side. And I said, well, what's the other side? And she said, angels, loved ones that have passed on, spirits that want to involve themselves in your welfare, but you have to ask. So the original, I wrote this whole account in the light that was dark from the new age to amazing grace the original book was published by moody press back in 1992 and on the cover of the original book i'm lying on the flat roof of my house on a starry night the night that i'd seen the psychic and i'm praying and i'm saying you on the other side i want you to come into my life i want to be more spiritual i want to grow pretty sincere and pretty sincerely deceived what was that? It was like a reverse sinner's prayer. I just gave permission to the spirit world to come into my life and, and lead me, and boy, did they. Remember in Ephesians uh, 4, 27, where it says, neither give place to the devil. Anytime you do something like what I did, now a Christian wouldn't do that, but a Christian can pick up the shack and think it's a great book and give it to a friend and not know that that book is a, is a stepping stone into the new age, into the new spirituality, because the Jesus of the shack says that God is in everyone. Anybody that's read the shack, or if you have that book at home, if you look at the word creation, it's spelled at least 20 times with a capital C. That's how we knew that God was in his creation, because capital C. In that book, we're also told by one of the Trinity that evil does not exist. How about that? But yet people are crazy about the shack. They, they just, they're giving it to their friends. And I'm gonna interrupt and I'm just gonna read this because I think it's really important because it has to do with the shack. It has to do with the way that we're all drawn off. It's an article that was written by Dr. Harry Ironside. Uh, he was the uh, pastor of Chicago's Moody Memorial Church from 1930 to 1948. And I think really I should start the whole talk by saying, why are we even talking about this stuff? Well, we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, 2 Corinthians 2.11, we know that. And we need to be aware of what our friends, neighbors, co-workers, family, I mean, they're involved in this stuff. We can't just say, I don't watch Oprah. Or one woman was given the shack by a woman she'd been witnessing to for three years, and she threw it in the garbage because she said it was no good. I said, well, 
you can use that as a way of communicating the gospel by saying, you know, that's a really tricky book because it looks like it's kind of godly, but it really isn't. So is exposing, er exposing Error, Is It Worthwhile? is the name of this article. And I just want to read this because all of us that try to talk about this stuff, we're quickly labeled like, hey, you're being negative. You know, you're kind of a naysayer. Or the emerging church loves to say, we have a hope-filled eschatology, not a doomsday eschatology. Well, our answer should be, we have a hope-filled eschatology too. We just gotta go through a few hard times, perhaps, and some persecution, whatever. We have to be prepared for the worst. But we have a hope-filled because Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our hope. But the world is trying to recreate the future. They're trying to do away with the fact that Armageddon is a prophecy. It's a prophecy, folks. It says that right there in Revelation. Jesus says it. It's a prophecy. What we're being told not only by the New Age, New Spirituality, but the forces within the church, the emerging church, people like Leonard Sweet, people like Erwin McManus that are calling themselves futurists, they say that we can recreate the future. We just have to all come together and agree that we can have a hope-filled eschatology. Well, that sort of steps over this whole idea that the, that the doctrine that founds this whole recreation of the future is that God is in everyone and everything. Ironside said, objection is often raised, even by some sound in the faith, regarding the exposure of errors being entirely negative and of no real edification. Of late, the hue and cry has been against any and all negative teaching. But the brethren who assume this attitude forget that a large part of the New Testament, both of the teaching of our blessed Lord himself and the writings of the apostles, is made up of this very character of ministry, namely, showing the satanic origin and therefore the unsettling results of the propagation of erroneous systems, which Peter, in his second epistle, so definitely refers to as damnable heresies. We are called upon to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints while we hold the truth in love. The faith means the whole body of revealed truth and to contend for all of God's truth necessitates some negative teaching. I'm sorry, but most of our Christian leaders these days are not talking about the deception that's right in our midst. When I was a hospice social worker, I would go into people's homes and being on hospice meant somebody was pretty much gonna die within 90 days to, to six months. But a lot of families just wouldn't even talk about it. It was like it wasn't happening. We used to call it the horse on the dining room table. That's what's going on in the church today. You're fortunate to have a pastor who's willing to bring these things to the surface to talk about them. Rick Warren said that it helps to know that Satan's entirely predictable. It's not real helpful. It's, it's not only not helpful, it's, it, it's harmful to the body of Christ. This is pretty consistent throughout many of the church leaders today where they will either say that prophecy is none of our business, that's another one that he, uh, Rick Warren actually puts that in Jesus' mouth and says that Jesus basically said that prophecy is none of our business. It helps to know that Satan's entirely predictable. Why did I write a book on the New Age implications of, of Rick Warren's purpose-driven church? Because when I saw that he introduced hope and purpose in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, by referring to Dr. Bernie Siegel, a New Age leader I knew well. Bernie Siegel has a spirit guide named George who directs him in his life. I know it sounds, it sounds funny, but these guys are serious. It's just like what Ray was talking about with the Reiki guides. They're getting information from the spirit world and they're believing it to be authoritative. So Rick Warren starts his book about purpose by referring to a new age leader who has a spirit guide named George? I kind of went, because I didn't know anything about Rick Warren, never, had never heard of him until his book became so popular. And I'm reading his book because everybody around me was reading his stuff. They had banners on churches, we're purpose driven, 40 days of purpose, and they're just going wild. I, got, I better check this out. Then when I got to page 88, Rick Warren, quoting from a new century version Bible, said, God rules everything, is everywhere, and is in everything. And I went, uh-oh, where'd that come from? Ephesians 4, 6 is what he quoted. And in that passage, Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, and of course, the Holy Spirit is sent, and in that sense, you know, God is in the believer. It's very specific, but no, there's Rick Warren saying that God is in 
everything. Well, it was then that I hung my head and I knew, oh no, I gotta quit my job again and write another book. It was like, how can you, how can you let something like that go? You can't. You can't let that go. Interestingly, in the shack, Ray didn't tell this uh, story. I hope I'm not stealing something from his afternoon thing, but he went to see Paul Young, the author of The Shack, give a presentation up in the Portland area. And there were questions, and Ray stood up and he said, is God in everything? And the author of The Shack said, yes, it's in the Bible, Ephesians 4, 6. He went right to that same passage that Rick Warren used. Okay, here's the big picture. The devil wants everyone, including the church, to believe that everything is connected, that everything is one. Oneness pervades everything. Eugene Peterson in the message, in this area of Ephesians 4, 6, he says, oneness permeates everything you think and say and do. Eugene Peterson has the phrase, as above, so below, in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, instead of in earth as it is in heaven, as above, so below. I knew that phrase because that's one of the most magical New Age terms that's been around for centuries. It means that God is not only transcendent out there, he's imminent inside each and every person. What's as above, so below doing in the middle of the Lord's Prayer with Eugene Peterson? Well, probably the same reason that Eugene Peterson's name is at the top of the shack, endorsing the shack, and comparing it to, to Bunyan's, John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. But we're supposed to think, hey, this is all coming together. It's like, if you will, we've had, like, you know those connect the dot pictures where you connect the dots, you don't know what it's going to be, and when you finish, there's the picture, okay? You've got the church, we know what that's going to be. You've got the new age. What's happening now is the devil is superimposing a new picture, a larger picture, if you will, over those two pictures and coming up with a new spirituality. And that new spirituality says that God is in everyone and everything. And because of that, we're all one. Well, Acts 17, 26 says that we're all one blood. Think about it. We all have an original set of parents. We are all connected, if you will, or related in that sense. But what's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is spirit. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot make that quantum leap from the flesh into the spirit and say that we're all one. By the way, what did God think of oneness in Genesis 11? Now that this people is one, there's nothing that they can't imagine to do. And he threw the Tower of Babel down and scattered them all over the place. That's what God thinks of artificial New Age oneness. Another way of looking at this, when you hear more and more about oneness, which you will, Jesus said that the way is narrow that leads to eternal life. This is tough, and few there be that find it. When I was a brand new believer, I recognized right away that that was the dividing line. And I knew that they would try to change that because it really tells you that what calls itself worldwide, Rick Warren says there's like two billion Christians in the world. Sorry, Rick, you know, I mean, it's like he's including everything in the kitchen sink in that definition. So this idea that we're all one is, is going to be the foundation, I believe, of a world peace plan that's right on the horizon. Remember the prophet Daniel in Daniel 8 said about Antichrist, by peace, he will, he will destroy many. And he also said that Antichrist would destroy wonderfully. This is King James. It's, I had a King James Bible when I came into the faith because I, when I was in the New Age, as a social worker, I went over to this client's house and his uh, elderly mom said, Warren, do you love God? And I said, oh yeah. And she said, tell me about him. And I told her and she was horrified. And she went in the other room. <laughs> She went in the other room and got this big blue Southwest Radio Bible Church King James Bible, and that's what I had when I came across. And people say, are you King James only? I say, I've only used the King James. never had any reason not to use it. It was there, and it's been faithful. And so I'm saying that because Daniel, in, in that 8, 24, 25 section, says that Antichrist will destroy wonderfully. The prophet Jeremiah, the Lord speaking through prophet Jeremiah in, in Jeremiah 5, 30, 31, said, a wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and my people love to have it so. What does everybody say about Oprah? She's wonderful. What's she teaching? It's horrible. It's more than horrible. It's blasphemy. And I'll get into that. 
So anyway, back to Ironside, he says, it has always been the duty of every loyal servant of Christ to warn against any teaching that would make him less precious or cast reflection upon his finished redemptive work and the all-sufficiency of his present service as our great high priest and advocate. There is a constant temptation to compromise. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. It's always right to stand firmly for what God has revealed concerning his blessed son's person and work. The father of lies deals in half-truths and specializes in most subtle fallacies concerning the Lord Jesus, our soul and sufficient Savior. Now listen to this, because you, you'll hear this thing, uh, all truth is God's truth. Not if it's mixed in with deception. Remember the devil in the, in, in the temptation of the wilderness, he saw that Jesus was coming back with, it is written, he would respond with scripture. So the devil goes, oh, okay, I can do that. So he pulls some scripture up and tries to come back with scripture. All truth is God's truth. You have to look at the context. That's a favorite phrase in the emerging church, all truth is God's truth, because then they can pull something that Buddha said or Lao Tzu or Confucius or someone else, and it may very well be true, but they're using it to make a point to draw you away from the Lord. Error is like leaven of which we read a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Truth mixed with error is equivalent to all error, except that it's more innocent looking and therefore more dangerous. God hates such a mixture. Any error or any truth and error mixture calls for definite exposure and repudiation. To condone such is to be unfaithful to God and his word and treacherous to imperiled souls for whom Christ died. We can't mess around. We have to be, when I, when I was drawn in through that prayer on my rooftop, things just started to explode. I had, a, I had an experience on a mountaintop that I go into great detail in, in the light that was dark. But I had all these things coming at me, making me feel like what I was doing was really good. The devil can make you feel really good about things that are really bad, and he can make you feel really bad about things that are really good. And that's just the way he operates. And, and yet we were being told, go with your experience, go with your feelings. I know a friend of mine who started to read The Purpose Driven Life. And she was on guard, she had been warned, and she said she got real giddy when she started reading the book. She said it was inexplicable, she got real giddy. People go, oh, I felt wonderful reading that book. Doesn't matter how you feel. Is it biblical, is it not biblical? So I got involved with Rajneesh. Then I got involved with a thing called A Course in Miracles. Has anybody heard of The Course in Miracles? Okay. Oprah Winfrey had this taught on her Oprah and Friends radio station daily, two or three times a day, all during, night, or, yeah, it was 2008. But what I noticed was I was involved with the Course in Miracles, and uh, it was like it was like my New Age Bible. And in 1992, Oprah Winfrey had Marianne Williamson, an unknown writer, on her show, and Oprah said the following about Marianne Williamson's book, A Return to Love: Reflections on the Principles of a Course in Miracles. Oprah said about Marianne, she's a leader in a philosophy that I know could change the world. I believe that with all my heart. I've read many books over the years. I've never been as moved by a book as I have by Marianne Williamson's book, A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. So moved, in fact, that I went out and bought a thousand copies and will be giving you a copy before you leave here today. If it sounds like I'm trying to hype the book, I really am. It's the first time you can open a book and actually see some answers. Let's take a look at what The Course in Miracles that she's so excited about and so enthusiastic about. The Course in Miracles came about when a psychologist, a female psychologist in New York City at Columbia University Medical Hospital heard an inner voice saying, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. She kind of went, what? But she ended up doing it. For seven years, she took down what this inner voice told her. The inner voice claimed to be Jesus with modern day revelation. Think about that. Modern day revelation goes into the Course in Miracles. In 1975, it was published. 1979, Gerald Jampolsky, a psychiatrist, published a little book called Love is Letting Go of Fear. And he said, everything in this book is based on the principles of A Course in Miracles. I was given that book in a massage class. I was training to be a massage practitioner when I was in the New Age. I was given that book. I loved the little book. It talked about gratitude. It talked about uh, forgiveness. It talked about uh, unconditional love. It, it grabbed me there. But then the other teachings, I, I didn't have any defense because I didn't have the Bible. I didn't have a background. 
So I got the Course of Miracles, got involved with that. I was in a Course of Miracles group. So I was very aware of A Course of Miracles when Oprah was pushing it. Here's what the Jesus of A Course of Miracles says. Oprah's Jesus. This Jesus says the recognition of God is the recognition of yourself. When God created you, he made you part of him. When asked if he was the Christ, he said, oh yes, along with you. The name of Jesus Christ as such is but a symbol, a symbol that's safely used as a replacement for the many names of all the gods to which you pray. Well, as Ray mentioned, Psalm 39.5 really lays it on the line. Verily, man at his best state is altogether vanity. Right before that, it says that the end of man's days helps him to know how frail he is, how he needs a savior how we need the Lord, not that you're God and you're self-sufficient, link up with everybody else and what a powerful force we can create. We can create peace in this world. I hate to, to even do a couple more of these, but you need to understand how blasphemous. This isn't like, oh, Oprah. This is like Oprah, chief false prophet of our time, teacher after teacher, book after book. She has the Midas touch she says to go get it. I've been down at Barnes & Noble when, when people come screaming in the store saying, what was that book that Oprah just recommended? I mean, it's unbelievable. The Jesus of, of the Course in Miracles and of Oprah and also Wayne Dyer and others says, do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. The journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Folks, we're talking, we're talking satanic blasphemy here. We're not talking like, oh, Oprah's a little deceived. She's a good-hearted person. Well, she may be a good-hearted person. I was when I was in the New Age. I was sharing this with my friends. I used to have developmentally disabled clients on my caseload. I'd go to the sheltered workshop. I'd do meditations and Sufi dance, have them do affirmations, and I was teaching them this stuff. When I became a believer, I had a lot of people I had to go talk to. The crucifixion did not establish the atonement, the resurrection did. We just did away with Hebrews 2, where the devil was defeated on the cross of Calvary. Evil, sin, the devil, but these things aren't real. You know what the New Age says about evil? The only thing satanic, the New Age says, is not believing that you're God. Uh-oh, wait a second, who did that just spell as satanic? Us. Of course, the miracle says all the, who oppose the Christ, the Course of Miracles Christ, are anti-Christ. Get it? We are anti-Christ by the definition of the new age. Why? Because we're going to be holding back the peace process. Why? Because we're not going to agree that we're all divine and that we can just kind of let this little minor doctrine of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, the atonement, go. They want that to go. Let the divisive doctrines go. Let's find what we agree on. No. Few there be that find it. I'm just looking down at Proverbs 24:10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. We're there. We're in the days of adversity. How are you doing with your friends that are getting lost in all this stuff and your family members? I had a man come up to me after Ray talked, and uh, people have family members that are getting, even as believers, they get inadvertently referred to New Age practitioners and to things that are going on. You have to know the deception. It comes down to that simple idea that all of humanity is connected because we're all one, because we're all God. Here's a simple example to help you understand how the New Age and the world, and I believe the apostate church that's growing steam as we speak, looks at this whole thing. The Christmas tree at the White House or at Rockefeller Center, you know, they, they, you know the president throws the switch, the whole tree lights up. When I was a kid, if one of those bulbs didn't work, it short-circuited the whole tree. The tree wouldn't light up. That's what they're saying about those people who do not believe in their own divinity, that they will short-circuit humanity's ability to connect and get world peace. And I believe that's why Daniel said, by peace he shall, he shall deceive many and destroy many. And that's how it's, it's going to happen through peace. Uh, Bob Dylan, when I was a brand new believer, had a song, and it was called, Sometimes Satan Comes as a Man of Peace. And he laid out all these verses where it was just so clear that the devil comes as a deceiver, and he can use peace, he can use love, he can even use scripture to try to draw you into these false teachings. 
The journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto, uh, unto us which are saved is the power of God. The Apostle Paul said, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Of course, the miracles, Jesus says, there is no sin. 1 John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Do you get it? This is the Bible upside down. This is, no, this is like a satanic Bible. But it all sounds really good because really nice people are pushing it. When I was shown that I was a part of this, it was really sobering. And I'll tell you how it happened. We were flying high. My wife was my girlfriend at the time. We were flying high. We were doing New Age workshops in our town. Uh, we were sharing. We were evangelizing our community. We were, we were just right at the height of all of this stuff. And all of a sudden, this kind of like, we didn't know how to describe it. Because see, you've got to understand when you're in the New Age, there's no evil. If you're feeling something that's dark and kind of ominous out there, then you need to go inside yourself and see what's wrong with you. What's your fear? What's your problem? You fix that, and then your world changes. Well, we did all that, and this oppression would come and go, particularly troubled my wife. We did every, we, we repeated our Course in Miracles affirmations, like in my sinlessness, or in my harmlessness, in my sinlessness, my safety lies. How do you like that one? That's a little bit different than put on the forearm of God. We did all that. We even went to our, we even went to our um, Course in Miracles group leaders. They've been around for years. And we told them what was happening. There's something going on. It seems to be connected to a particular person that we had encountered. And uh, they sort of scratched their heads and they said, well, let's get in a circle. Let's hold hands and we'll send love and light to this person. So we do that. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, there's got to be something else. So as we broke hands and we were about to leave, I turned around, looked at, you know, the course group leader and his wife. And I said, isn't there anything else we can do? You know what his wife said? Put on the full armor of God and stand fast against the wiles of the devil. I said, what? Her husband went even louder. What? <laughs> now, honey, now, honey. She used to be an evangelical Christian. She lost heart. She walked away from her church. She got drawn into the new age, but she pulled that out of her reservoir. And I said, Julie, what, what, what is that? And she says, read Ephesians. So we went back, had, had the Bible that was sitting there from the client's mother, read Ephesians 6, and I turned to Joy and I said, isn't that sweet? She must have had some Bible background or something, you know, closed the Bible, put it away, didn't get it. Meanwhile, the presence didn't leave. So we kept trying to figure out, well, what do we do here? This is the conflicting with everything that we believe. We figured we put some space between us and our Northern California home. We went down to see Joy's mom who lived in Manhattan Beach. Guess what? The spirit, or whatever that was, we didn't call it a spirit then, but the, the oppression followed us. One day while Joy was with a friend, I went to a little bookstore. Some of you may have seen it years ago. It's gone now. The Either Or Bookstore in Hermosa Beach. And I went to the New Age section. I certainly didn't go to the Christian section because no good New Ager ever thinks of doing that. And I, I pulled down this book that looked kind of interesting. It was called The Beautiful Side of Evil by a woman named Johanna Michelson. Never heard of her. Pulled out the book and started reading it. And I went, wow, the woman had gone. She had, she had actually um, been in drama. She had to deal with some kind of a spiritual presence. She did a lot of the things that we did. She ended up as a spiritual healer in Mexico with a, a spirit guide named Hermanito that was channeling through this woman. They're doing miraculous healings. And then one day something went wrong in one of the healings. A Christian woman had come in. Something went terribly wrong, and Johanna started to question what was going on. Meanwhile, she had these scriptures. I went, wow, that's interesting, scripture. And I started writing some of this stuff down. And as I was sitting there on the floor writing this down, a homeless mentally ill guy that I'd seen on the street the day before came back into the part of the store, into the store, back to where I was, and he started yelling at me, are you going to buy that book? What are you doing with that book? Are you going to buy that book? And I went, oh my goodness. Can evil orchestrate somebody right off the street to come in and hassle me? Is evil real? Is this, is this for sure? And I had to just go, something's going on here. And it goes beyond what we were taught in the New Age. Anyway, I'd worked with homeless. I dealt with him. He left the store. I had my notes, and I had a specific answer from her on how to deal with this presence that was different than anything I'd ever seen before. 
You'd think I'd buy the book. No, you're too proud as a new ager to buy a Christian book, but she seemed to have some good answers, and I believe what she was saying, so I had it written down. The next day, this, this presence was there again. I could tell because it particularly bothered, you know, I could see it on the facial features of my wife. She's not possessed, but oppressed. We went in the backyard, and I said, Joy, I want to try something just a little bit different here. Don't be scared. And repeating what Johanna had said in her book, I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone. I forbid your presence here. I claim the blood of Jesus Christ upon us. Go to where Jesus sends you. And it was like, whoosh. It was like gone. Joy said, what was that? I said, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> but it has something to do with a victory that Jesus won on the cross of Calvary over Satan. Somehow Satan is, is a formidable evil force that we have to come to terms with. We need to start reading the Bible. Okay, you'd think we'd drop down on our knees and, and just get saved in that moment. No, not when you've been through the years of teachings that we did. We started reading them back and forth. We'd read them both in the morning and then Anybody that reads The Light That Was Dark carefully will see that I'm pretty much trailing along behind my wife going, really, honey, you think so? And what, what happened one day was she said, I don't think the Jesus of A Course in Miracles is the real Jesus. She says, I think that's the Jesus that Paul was warning about in 2 Corinthians 11, where he said, if one comes and preaches another Jesus with another spirit, another gospel, you might just go for it. And that's exactly what Oprah is doing on TV. That's exactly what the New Age Jesus is. You can't just say Jesus like Jesus in the shack. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one who died on the cross for our sins. You can't just say Christ either. Christ is a universal term. We have to be really specific these days. We have to ask good questions when people start bringing these things up. People ask, well, how can you do that? You know, you, you weren't a believer. How can you do that? You know, it didn't, you know, didn't the sons of Sceva say, you know, in the name of Paul's Jesus, and they got attacked? I'll tell you why. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the book of Isaiah and Philip came alongside, I believe the Lord provided Johanna Michelson. Whether or not she was there in person, it didn't matter. I had her story, I had the scriptures, I had the truth, and I believed it. Particularly after that man came in the store. Little footnote to the story. One emergent leader talks about, he makes fun of Campus Crusade for Christ. He talks about churchy things like doctrine. <sighs> excuse me, As Steve Martin used to say, excuse me. He made fun of Campus Crusade for Christ. He said that he used to do that, and he would be embarrassed to sit next to somebody where he'd gone and talked to them. Let me tell you, after we became believers, I was driving to work one day, and we'd been witnessing to a lot of our friends, and it was just bouncing off them. I thought they'd go, oh, wow, man, okay, yeah, I'm going to accept the Lord. It was tough. It was like very few of our friends were getting it. <clears throat> Lord, how did we get out of this? What he did is he brought to mind in my senior year in college, in our fraternity house, we were going out drinking one night, and we were told that we had a mandatory fraternity house meeting. We had to be there. We went, what do you mean we got to be there? What is it? Campus Crusade for Christ. Campus Crusade for Christ? Well, why do we have to be at that? You do. Just be there. Okay. We were. Three guys came in. Two of them were going, yeah, sure, right. Okay. Yeah, great. Glad you accepted the Lord. Third guy, all of a sudden, was like, Phew. All I heard was, what have you got to lose by asking Jesus into your life tonight? I didn't catch the stuff about sin. I didn't repent. I just prayed that night, and I said, Jesus, if you're really out there, come into my life. I honestly believe that he honored that prayer, because I haven't met tons of people that have come out of the New Age and are really talking about it a whole lot. A lot of them came into the church and brought their occultic gifts with them, their meditation. I even know a guy that had a kind of a phony New Age conversion and, and was teaching people in the church how to meditate. You know what courage it took for the Campus Crusade people to come into a fraternity house like we had, a bunch of drinkers and jocks and, you know, it was just, you know, I thought about that later. That took some real courage. And here, the emerging church guy just kind of, flew, oh yeah, well that's not cool. Well, that was the front cover of Christianity Today this month with Jesus with sunglasses, and it talks about Christian hipsters when church meets cool. Well, let me tell you something. It's not cool to disregard the Bible. That's what these guys do universally. They pick what they want, and they avoid anything that talks about deception or anything that's going on. 
It's unbelievable. So in closing, I just want to make mention of, I, well, Xavier said it in Kansas City. He was, he was doing a study on Jeremiah, and he just stopped. And I think he said something like, wow, I love the Bible. And I sat there and I went, he really does, and I do too. Why? Because it's God's truth. Nothing but the truth, all truth. And it was the Bible that read like the morning newspaper, or much better, about everything that had been going on in our life. It was like a Geiger counter. You can count on it. You can measure everything that's going on by the Bible, not by spiritual experience. We'll talk more about that this afternoon. That's where the devil wants to take the church, into spiritual experience. I love the Bible. Well, Luke 11:28. Jesus said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Then Jesus said to those Jews, 8, John 8, 31, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If you continue, if you keep, if you hold fast, if you contend for the faith, this is, this is a battle. This is a warfare. You know, your family's going down. Uh, just... The stuff's coming at people in lots of different ways. And it's really important that we know enough about what's going. You don't have to read all these people and get overwhelmed by what Ray's talking about, what I'm talking about. A lot of us, Roger Oakland wrote a book on the emerging church. Ray's got a great book uh, on uh, contemplative prayer. I've got some books there. We've consolidated it so you can get the information. You can share it. You can give it to people or whatever. And that's part of our job in the body of Christ. So you don't have to do that. You really, we, God doesn't want you reading a whole bunch of occult books. But we need to know what's going on. We need to know what the deception is. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, not compromising. Robert Schuller stood in front of millions of people back in 2003. He said, I've been learning something the last three years. And it's kind of making my faith a little bit broader. God is not just transcendent. He's imminent. Yes, God is alive, and he is in every single human being. That's in my book, Deceived on Purpose. Schuler is one of the primary proponents of leeching the church into the New Age, new spirituality. Two months after my book came out, showing Schuler's influence on Rick Warren, and talking about Gerald Jampolsky, the man that introduced me to the Course in Miracles, New Age leader, Two months after my book came out, Gerald Jampolsky was on Schuler's Hour of Power in 2004, and Schuler's recommending all of his books about the Course in Miracles. And you know what the response from Christian leadership was about that appearance? Zippo. Do you know what that's like to see the person that involved me in all this blasphemy being held up and his books recommended by Robert Schuler? And people will say, oh, yeah, well, Robert Schuler. Hey, Robert Schuler's trained thousands of ministers. Rick Warren among them, and Schuler bragged about how he mentored Rick Warren. Came to my institute time after time. But you think Rick Warren's going to say, oh yeah, yeah, I love Robert Schuler. His wife did. His wife said in a Christianity Today article that Schuler had a profound influence on Rick Warren. Anyway, we'll talk more about this later, but contend for the faith. Fight the good fight. You're not going to hear this from the hipster church, from the emerging church, but you're going to hear it in this church because I told my wife when I was coming here, I said, you know, I got a chance to, you know, to talk with Xavier a little bit and his wife. And I said, I think this church is going to be kind of gritty. And <laughs> it is. And, and, and Ray said, well, you mean good grit, right, Warren? I said, true grit. God bless you guys. Have a good lunch.